Hey guys, so before we get into today's video, I just want to say that I don't think you will find a more serious and rigorous scholar of theology in the church than Blake Osler. What Joseph Smith is teaching, as I take it, is what you know Jesus was teaching in John 14 through 17, this kind of mutual glorification. Blake is the author of the Exploring Mormon Thought book series and podcast with the same name, which you can find on Spotify or iTunes. Blake is fluent or semi-fluent in nine languages, including Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Egyptian. He will take any reader or listener on a serious, rational exploration of our theology and doctrine. So be sure to check out his book series, Exploring Mormon Thought, and or subscribe to his podcast under the same name. So in today's video, Forrest and I discuss some pretty deep topics, so I wanted to make this preface to help orient listeners a bit. In reflecting on the conversation, I think both Forrest and I were linguistically sloppy, but that can happen when trying to deal with abstract topics that are trying to make sense of infinite things. So in the second half of this video, we get into the paradox of ultimate causation. And here's what I mean by that. When we see a phenomena, we believe that it has a cause. For instance, if you see a wildfire, you can ask what caused it. And someone might say, lightning. But what caused the lightning? And then someone might say, well, chemistry, you know, chemical reactions in the sky. But then you could ask, well, what caused chemistry? And then someone might explain how physics gives rise to chemistry and on and on and on. You can keep asking this, well, what caused that? The question is, is do these causal chains go on forever? And there really are either two options. Either causation goes back infinitely into the past, or else there is some original uncaused cause. Now, the conversation that follows in this episode with Forrest was inspired by my debate with Seth, where I said that anything that comes into existence is either the product of random chance or design. Please note the part that says that which comes into existence. You see, I am talking about contingent things or things that have a cause. In other words, the, the blue circles in this diagram. You can't say that something that exists eternally is either the product of chance or design because by definition, it's not the product of anything. However, and this is the key point, we can make inferences about the nature of the uncaused cause based on what emerges from it. And that is the point I drive at in the later half of our discussion. It's nonsense to talk about if chance or design produced the uncaused cause, because nothing produced it. But it's not nonsense to explore the nature of the uncaused cause based on what emerged from it. Okay, so, when looking for ultimate causes, there are only so many options. For an atheist, you can say that there is an infinite regress of processes that are not governed by any kind of eternal law that connects or controls them, which basically is to say that we're here by total random chance. Or, you can say that there just happens to have always been certain laws, and those just happened to exist in such a way that humans necessarily emerged from them. Now, on the theist side, most classical theists hold to the uncaused ultimate designer. In other words, God is the uncaused cause who has eternally existed and brought about all things. However, there are two major issues here. The first is for the atheist side, and that is laws don't start processes. Agents do. In fact, laws are just patterns we observe in the emergent universe. Laws don't have volition or will to make something happen. They're merely descriptive. Natural things react to prior causes, but agents, by definition, are able to act for themselves, to set things in motion, as it were. On the other hand, if we look at the classical theists, it's incoherent to say that God exists without positing some kind of framework for that existence. God cannot exist without existing within some kind of realm, 
And to exist within any sort of realm that has any definition at all means that it must have particular properties or laws that act as the framework for that existence. Now, this is a very large topic, but it's where the restored gospel begins to speak as it critiques classical theistic notions of God. The restored gospel speaks of God eternally coexisting with eternal law, and that God, like a painter, is creating something beautiful within those eternal constraints. He is refining reality into habitable order for our benefit and glory. So in the end, the restored gospel presents a new concept of God. It posits God as existing within a framework, but that he is creating something beautiful and inviting his children to join in that process. Now, with that said, many Latter-day Saints hold to a conception where there exists not an ultimate designer, but an infinite regress of designers engaged in the work of creation. Now, again, this is all very deep stuff that, you know, humans have been wrestling with these kind of questions for thousands of years, and I'm not here claiming that I have every answer. I'm just talking about the models that exist. But in the end, there are really only two options. Either there exists an infinite regress of causes, or else there exists some uncaused cause. Anyway, I hope this preface helps clarify things a bit as you watch Forrest and I engage with this complex philosophical topic. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. Today is a special episode because I am joined by my brother, the host of Latter-day Skeptic, Forrest Hansen. Forrest, how you doing? Doing good. Excited to be back. Uh... I think the last time we did this, it was like, yeah, we're going to start putting these out all the time. And then months <laughs> go by, we don't connect. And it yeah. takes like an issue, like a, a couple of videos of us going back and forth to be like, okay, we need to actually just get on camera again. Yeah. And, you know, I'm little excited. things happen like, you know, having children, your first child. So yeah, yeah. that's the big news uh, today, everyone. I've been a little busy. Big, big news. Forrest has joined the ranks of parents with the birth of his first child, a boy. How's that going? Honestly, it's been amazing. Love every bit of it. Um, he's healthy, which is about all you can ask for, and cute also, which is a plus. He's adorable. Um, I'm just mad I haven't got to meet him yet, but you guys are coming to town soon. I, I will say he's been cramping my YouTube style a little bit. It's harder <laughs> to put out content when you have kids. <laughs> and it was wait till you have four, like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't well, know. I how figured out. It gets easier when they get older. We were talking. To, well, it depends on how much older. Uh, apparently, the newborn stage is the easy stage. Everyone keeps saying, "Like, oh yeah, you guys can go out." And he's he's just as quiet in the in the car seat. Wait till he starts running around. It's gonna be a pain to go out. I'm like, oh, I thought it got easier from here. No, it's kind of yeah. It's kind of like there are challenges at each phase. But for me, it was like 18 months. I feel like, especially because we had twins off the bat. Yeah. When you got twin 18 months and they run That's, in separate directions, wow. you have to like pick which one you love more. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> <true. gonna> <laughs> anyway, well, cool, man. Well, uh, as everyone hopefully knows, Forrest and I obviously have very different points of view. Forrest is a former member of the church. I'm so obviously active in the church, um, but hopefully we can model how uh, family members can still maintain good relationships and if possible, which isn't always possible, uh, engage in, in good productive discussions. Um, even if we, you know, get after it a little bit, we always remember that we're still brothers. All righty. So, um, this episode, we're going to get started. Forrest is kind of going to run the topic for us. And so Forrest hit it. Cool. Um, so, I've been taking shots at you on a couple of videos and you actually recently took a, I guess a response. It wasn't really a shot at me, but it was just a response to me. I, I threw a little elbow in with it too. Yeah. There, there was some elbows in there, um, <laughs> which I appreciated. And it was over the topic of fine tuning, um, which is a fun topic. It, I think it, it sits right in that wheelhouse for both of us where like it's much more philosophically based and just pure logic vice, you know, where you come with a bunch of presuppositions that we disagree with. It's, it's a level one conversation, which is easier for us to engage in. Um, 
But what's interesting and what I want to bring up in this video is maybe a flaw that I see you present. I, I basically see you presenting the fine tuning argument. But to me, the fine tuning argument stands at odds with the Mormon conception of God. Yeah. I so first, I'll, I'll kind that. of steel man what you're saying with the fine tuning argument, which is basically that the cosmological constants, there's a whole bunch of numbers that are at the root of our understanding of physics, that if those constants were tweaked a little bit, um, and this is a, a misconception that even ex-Mormons and atheists get into, um, I'm thinking of uber-Mormon, when they talk about like, it's not that evolution wouldn't have happened or something at that level, it's the universe or matter itself wouldn't have even been able to come together. Like the planets couldn't form. Chemistry wouldn't be able to, wouldn't act the way that we see it acting. Um, and because those constants are the way they are, and they're not any other number that they could possibly be, that that indicates that there was a designer at the root of it. Is that basically... Yeah. Uh, the only the only thing I would change a little bit of it is that you're being specific in talking about the constants and quantities of physics. Um, and those are an, the example of fine tuning. But even beyond that, there's a there's a philosophical sort of angle to this um, that is saying that the the nature of the universe, the properties of the universe had to have they either have to have always been or which which in my mind says that it's chance because it's just it just happens to have been this way for all eternity past or they came into being at which case i would say that there there is either again it, it either boils down to it either came about by chance or it came about by design and that's sort of the fundamental argument that i was making is that those are in my in my estimation the way i viewed this whole subject is that those are the only two options that I've been able to find uh, to to explain. It isn't it isn't even that I'm making the case for design per se. I'm just more than anything pointing to saying that's those are the only two options. So if you if you don't believe that it was designed, that means that you have to believe that it was chance. That's the only other option that's available. So so I'm going to avoid a little bit. I mean, if, if we have time at the end, I'll bring up. Um, we've talked about this before, and I have a few. Like I, I, for the most part, agree with you, but I think there's some nuance to this either or that you're bringing up, but we can bring that up at the end. I more want to just talk about the the fine tuning argument is, and I'm, I'm not saying you're taking this, but it, it also doesn't really matter. All these arguments are out in public domain, so they're for anybody to use. Um, but these are very much like Frank Turek heavy arguments in his book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Um, yeah, Frank Frank Turek, uh, Stephen Meyer, uh, William Lane Craig. I drew a lot on. I would say actually, probably primarily William Lane Craig is where I at least was at first introduced to these ideas. And then, and just so you, everyone should know, this isn't like a Mormon thing. This is very much a Muslims will be involved in this conversation. Like anyone who who believes in some sort of an intelligent designer to the universe, and that the universe doesn't exist by chance. This is not a Mormon conversation, but I know you're saying like, but wait a minute, doesn't some of this not square with sort of Mormon theological? Sort yeah, of and, and I actually want to say exactly that this is typically a uh, more generic Christian conception of God argument. This is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial God argument. Yes, so fine tuning plus also the cosmological argument, basically, like if the universe came into existence and the universe consists of time, space, and material, and those things began, then the thing that made it couldn't have those properties. That's yes. In fact, the, the real, the real root of this is Plato and Aristotle. Uh, they were the ones who conceived of the unmoved mover. And it may have been Aristotle specifically who used that language. I can't remember which. And, and so there is definitely uh, a conception of God that I believe that the that traditional Christianity stole from Plato and Aristotle, and they bastardized the who God was, um, and that's where sort of the traditional Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, even Muslim, uh, and even Jewish conceptions of of monotheistic uh, God uh, kind of a lot of them tie their roots into that sort of a conception of God that, that Plato and Aristotle also. Have. So 
so how do you, would you describe the Mormon conception differing from that conception? So it's funny. Um, there are, well, first of all, we say that God is material. I, I believe, well, I'll put it this way. I think what they're describing is something that can't exist because when you say, I agree. If I, if I were to say that something is timeless, spaceless, and immaterial with no parts, no passions, and all the other stuff, it's like, that is a great description of nothing. <laughs> like, that's what nothing is. Yeah. So you're just describing a God that doesn't exist. So obviously, we believe in a corporeal God, uh, a, a God that actually has some sort of physicality. That's one of the first things. Um, we don't believe that God um, is... Uh, it, well, this is another problem you get into trouble with, with the language. Because if you're talking about God, you can be talking about different things. Um, I could be speaking about a specific person. I could be speaking about God the Father, right? Or I could be speaking about a title that is given to someone who has attained the qualities of divinity, right? So, so for this conversation, we'll go with God the Father. Okay, God the Father. God the Father is the one that I'm mostly interested in. Perfect. And I do, I will just because in, in preparing for this, there is one other notion of God that I want to to talk about, and that is the notion of God as the greatest power or thing in existence. Um, the thing that, and, and that is what in Latter Day Saint conception we would call eternal law. Um, it's the thing that even God is subject to. Because there are some people that literally their definition of God is the the highest thing. And we believe that God is actually subject to eternal law. And so that so I I, I just want to make sure that's clear just at the outset. But you're talking, you want to talk about the I mostly want to talk about God, God, the Father. God the Father. And basically I, I think you've agreed at this point that he is material. Yes. Uh, in and in now, I want to be very careful <laughs> because material doesn't mean that he's just like us materially. I would compare so, God the Father's materiality to Jesus Christ's materiality post resurrection. So, I, I, I listened to your uh, Jeff McCullough video on the nature of God, perfect. Um, which I think this, mo I think you were tiptoeing a little bit around it, um, but. So I, I looked up, you know, how the, the church has all those like kind of animated videos about like their beliefs. Uh -huh. and, and in one of those videos, I have it here if we want to share it or whatever. But it says that uh, the Mormon church believes that God has flesh and bone. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, in the sense that Jesus Christ had flesh and bone after his resurrection. Okay, so this gets into kind of what I think is the problem of... I really see you using the fine tuning argument as like, what is it? You're trying to have your cake and eat it too. It's like you want to use an argument that is typically used for timeless space minutes immaterial, but that actually doesn't square with your God. So you can have that conversation and it sounds great. But when you actually compare it to what your belief about God is, you realize there's some major flaws. Okay. Um, Let's explore it. So basically, if God's material, how does the fine-tuning argument help you when God's material depends upon physical laws that give rise to his material? So I wouldn't say necessarily that God's, that first of all, that our nature, our knowledge of physical laws is anywhere complete. I don't think we know the nature of material at all. Uh, I think we are, I, I think there, that material is a great mystery. Uh, still to be understood and discovered. But to say that he is subject to the same physical laws that I am, I don't believe that his body, it, like Jesus Christ's body could, you know, wasn't going to die ever. It was able to go through walls or whatever and ascend to heaven, but it did exist in some material sense. So when you say, does he have a body and what is the nature of that body? I'm, I'm really like, I can't say I know a lot about that. And I would definitely conclude though, just from what Jesus is, uh, from, from the, from Jesus Christ, uh, post-resurrection body, that his body is some, somehow different from ours in some fundamental way. 
So you don't think the laws of physics apply to the flesh and bone that God has? They not in the way that we currently understand it. Uh, I, I, obviously, they don't. For instance, his body, if his body doesn't die, well, then obviously the laws of thermodynamics in some way don't apply to to him in in the same way that they apply to a mortal body, which is the proper way to talk about our body versus a perfected and resurrected body. Okay, so let's, I, I think we kind of maybe got into a couple of these already and maybe can skip through them, but can we go to the slides I've got? Yeah. I yeah, jammed up real up. quick, so forgive any typos slash formatting errors. All right, so I, I made a few syllogisms um, and we'll kind of just go through them and see where you disagree um, with this conception that God is material, but also maybe different material and how that plays into the fine tuning argument. So this is each one of these. I have multiple slides. This one is like a full, they all play together. Um, so P1, material does not exist outside of our universe. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? I disagree with that. So oh, you, well, real, real quick, real quick, though, I would say this. My my other question, though, that I would have for you is how are you defining the universe? Are you defining the universe as all that exists? I, or, I define, are you, so, or are you re referring to the, ta the time space matter that we have observed and that we believe or that we currently experience? So this, I, I actually liked your differentiation when you were talking to Jeff McCullough. But I think you're not going to like my answer is everything that we have access to. Everything, everything that we currently have access to. Every, everything that we can have access to. Yeah, I'd say like while we're alive, basically. Yeah, I mean, well, then then in the observable universe is what you're talking about, or, or at least. Yeah, I mean, observable in some way. Experientially, we can observe that it exists. Yeah, basically currently. everything without the, um, I would almost call it special pleading of like, oh, but it, after we die, we will we'll experience it. But then it's like, well, how do you prove it here and now? You would even talk to Jeff, like if your spaceless time is immaterial, how do you interface with this universe in the way that Jesus did? You yeah, I, I mean, I would say that- interact. Well, I, I would reject premise one because I believe that if I'm gonna if I'm gonna define the universe as our local universe, which I think is what you're getting at, it's what emerged from the Big Bang, let's say. Okay. Um, then no, I I do not. I actually do believe, uh, at least provisionally, I lean towards the multiverse as a as a reality because I actually believe that God exists outside of the time space uh and the uni the local universe that we that we live in so i don't, this is like, I don't that... think i can get i don't think i can get on an air uh, on a spaceship and if i just go far enough i can find him he just lives really far away you know what i mean i just don't that isn't the way that i conceptualize god so i, I want to point out things one you are disagreeing with frank turks and william lane craig's cosmological argument which is one of their foundational arguments about how you can get past this level or into how you can prove God. You prove God looking at the Big Bang and then showing that that's when time, space, and material began. Therefore, God is timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that they're right to say that material began at that time. I, I the way that they define material is uh, see they believe in creation ex nihilo, which I reject. And I think that I reject it on philosophical grounds. From nothing, nothing comes. And and God is not nothing. So you can't say that there was nothing. There was God that existed before that. And so th there's, and to say that something exists, but it has no time, no space. Again, it just, the language becomes so incoherent that they can't describe it. I can't. And it's just, it all breaks down. But I do reject the notion that materiality came into being. And so to the degree to which the uh, Big Bang is true, which I believe that it is, uh, at least provisionally, that's kind of what I think is the best explanation based on the science. Uh, I, I believe that our universe emerged from something else. That was also material. That was also material, yes. 
Okay, so can Which, you go back way, to my? That, that's that's kind of the standard atheist view as well. Is that there was some sort of a uh, a let's call it a, a quantum soup or whatever, however you want to describe it, and from that, yeah, and I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that. I'm just going to point out the fact that the fine tuning argument then gets pushed into that dimension as well. Absolutely. So, so can you pull up the the slide? Yeah, yeah. I want to. I yeah, want to see it here. Let me pull it back up. So you do not believe, so you believe uh, P1 is wrong. Do you believe the fine tuning? Okay, so now I'm going to go to a different, because you reject these. Do you believe that our flesh and blood here on Earth exists because of fine tuning? Um, let me think about that. Uh Provision. I'm going to say yes, uh, just off the top of my head. So, so yeah, our flesh as and blood, a reference to our, 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 our flesh and blood, it, it is like we are designed, basically. So it is. I don't think that we are we are random products of chance. So, so, and just to kind of scope how fundamental the fine tuning argument is, um, when Frank Turek presents it, he says that you won't have chemistry, you won't have matter. Because if these cosmological constants are off. So if our blood and our flesh are made of matter, which they are, then they are a result of the fine tuning of the universe. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have, have an issue with that. I, I can bring up the slide again anytime if you want also. Yeah, I've also got them on this computer here, so I can also reference it. So then P2, God is made out of flesh and blood. Therefore, God is finely tuned. Um, I would agree that, well, there's two, there's two possibilities here. We're going to get into a, a big time Latter-day Saint conversation and debate that we have. So there are two schools of thought about the nature of God. One is that God is a, that there's an infinite regress of like fathers, right? All the way back. Okay. And each one is kind of like finally tuning the other and it just goes on forever, right? They're each, they're each being quote unquote created. And I don't mean created out of nothing. I mean, organized, finely tuned, right? But the great question is, is that do, you, you can either do that or you can posit, you know, the undesigned designer, the designer who always was, Right. That is uh, th that's the that's going all the way back to uh, to Aristotle's conception as well. The unmoved mover, the uncaused cause. Now, it, within Mormonism and, 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 and thought within the, the, the restoration's history, um, you have people like Brigham Young held to the infinite regress model. But on the other hand, you have people like and I think I think McConkie was on board with this, too. Um, and I think Joseph Smith was, and I think um, Orson Hi or Orson Pratt was, and, and this was the conception that it doesn't go back infinitely, that there is what you would call the most high God, the 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 unmoved mover essentially, that there an eternal being who always has been, um, and I lean towards that camp. Now, I just want to point out, though, just as a side note on this, because this is kind of a complicated topic, but it's a philosophical topic that everyone has to face. Atheists, everybody. Okay, even if you say that the world was caused by chance, let's say, or let's say like Seth was saying by evolution, you say, well, our universe came about by the product of an evolution that was going on in the multiverse sphere, right? Well, that has to say, well, then where did that... that multiverse had to have been finely tuned and what yeah, you get well you, i mean you and, have to get you ha you either have to posit it, it's just a philosophical fact you have to posit an infinite regress of causes or, or e e eternality e eternalness or, yeah, or, or an uncaused cause so i agree with i agree with that and i love that because i think oftentimes uh people like William Lane Craig, and I think yourself will point to infinite regress as like a, we can't have an infinite regress. So therefore uncaused cause. And it's like, they're both equally impossible in my mind. I don't think you're winning by choosing one or the other. We just, we're in this, 
philosophically and like super interesting area of like it's, what it's happens the when biggest... the only options are both impossible <laughs> it's it is the it is the big like and that's what i'm saying this is something that atheists that everyone has the posit and it goes all the way back to the greeks we're talking about this they were trying to figure out what the freak is going on and 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 so I, I lean towards the uncaused cause. I lean towards a, cause I, and I lean on that primarily theologically because I believe that, that scripturally what is revealed is a most high God, that there is some ultimate being that ultimately constitutes God. Um, and if so, somebody wanted to make a good argument against me, by the way, just to kind of help out Seth here. One of the challenges is then you say, well, doesn't that God exist by chance? He just, well, yeah, exactly. I think forever? the whole God thing just adds baggage and pushes the argument further back. So I guess this is what's funny. You brought that up. So go back one slide. Um, you can maybe a little nuance here. to, to people. Uh, no, not this one back one slide. Oh, you can, you can control the slides. I think, can't you? Let's see. Oh yeah, I can. Okay, so this is kind of what you were saying. Uh, I, this is like an argument for an infinite regress, which is basically P1, fine-tuning is how material exists. God's made out of material. God is eternal, therefore fine-tuning is also eternal. Yeah, I think your Are, next slide actually actually hit it better. Actually, you're right. Th so this is actually... Sorry, go. Uh, let's go back to this slide. Sorry, we're battling back and forth. Oh, sorry, you, uh, you control it. You control I, it. I got it. <laughs> so... This one is actually showing that just because you prove God is eternal doesn't prove that God is the the ultimate source. You could say fine tuning may be the thing that precedes God because God uh, requires fine tuning to even exist. Well, and that's and that's one of the things that you would say. Um, well, let me think about this. And, and this basically your premise one in your argument, which was anything that begins to exist is either design or chance. You could say that fine tuning never began to exist. It has always it has been eternal. And yeah, that's actually... well, that's and that's one of the that that's sort of the Latter Day Saint conception of the eternal law, that the eternal law is the most fundamental thing. It's spaceless. It's timeless. It's immaterial. It's it's some sort of a. So, so the question is: Is that random or designed? Uh, and that's that's the tough one. I agree. That one's the one where you go, well, but, but maybe that's it's all the, right. But what's funny is that's the tough one. It's the same one. It's just you just added this unprovable part in the middle, and then you're now stuck just like the rest of us. Well, no, saying oh, saying that it that it's chance that God just happened to exist. I'm saying yeah. Right now we're in this dilemma where we have this universe in, in front of us, and it was either designed or random. You say, but God, and now you have to answer the same question. We we have to answer no not if god not if god is eternal no if god because... is eternal and god is material presumably god is subject to eternal law which mormons believe therefore that eternal law where did that come from it will it being eternal it, it's it's not it is not a it doesn't have a cause that's the thing my first premise is is that which begins to, exist. to exist because it, if it didn't begin to exist then that is this. It's it's just a it's a question that doesn't make any sense when you say, well, what caused the eternal thing? It's yeah, like, yeah. The, the causes happen in time. That's fine, but I would say it's just equally as absurd as making up another cause and then having an infinite regress, time or was, just saying, I, I I agree. When you start getting outside of time, things start breaking down pretty fast, and they're but hard that's to what, even your, your argument in that debate was one of these arguments. It was an argument that things break down so fast. You're at the edge of what makes sense. And so now we're just debating basically eternal causes or, or an infinite regress or an eternal cause. An yeah, cause. And, and, and but, but, but we can say that those causes that are an infinite regress, are they just chance or are they designed? That's the question. Right, because you could have an infinite regress of designers. That's the Mormon conception of, or the Latter Day Saint conception of an infinite regress of gods, right? Or you can sort of escape the entire infinite regress by appealing to a, uh, a, a something that doesn't regress or doesn't have to have a cause because it's eternal, right? And so, 
the, that's sort of the now granted you can do that with chance on the other side as well you can say well there's just an infinite series of things that just happen to have existed um and they you know it just happened to be this way which again you can do that and say that there's an infinite you know evolution like like seth kind of was saying that there's essentially evolution 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 all the way back into an infinite regress but ultimately that evolution all the way back isn't the product of any sort of design. It's just the product of chance. I don't know if that makes any sense. I mean, it, it does make sense. And I understand that it's like the, the chance design debate, but I just think you're adding an arbitrary stopping point. So that way you avoid that problem. So for example, why don't I just say, no, no, no. The universe began to exist and that was the uncaused cause. Yeah, that 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 the that that things just have like the constants and quantities of the universe. They've always been this way, and they just happen to be that way. And by and this is all yeah, which is the same thing as God. Like, what are the, God has always been that way, and or has always existed, and He just happens to be God. Like yeah, you're avoiding being having to explain how you got to God. By saying he's just always existed. So therefore, yeah, yeah. When, these... when you posit something that has existed eternally, but th this is the whole difference. Uh, my argument was that it's either design or it's chance. And so that thing that has always existed, if you want to say, well, it just exists by chance, then. No, 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 not always existed. You said always existed things don't follow, fall into chance or design, right? Always existing things? Things that have always existed are not subject to this dichotomy. Because they are not... Only things no that sense. begin to exist are the product of chance or design. I actually might need to revise that. Because here's the issue. If something exists forever, you would have to ask the question, well, why does it... Uh, or why does it happen to be the way that it is? You can say, well, it always has been, but why yeah, does it just happen to be that but, way? And that's where you're saying, and I agree, it's kind of a nonsensical question. Things don't, there is no cause that made it that way because it is uncaused. It is just that way, and there is no explanation for why it is that way. And that's kind of like the, that's like the get out of jail free card that, that God is pulling in this argument. Yeah, and, and and I guess you could say, well, things just this is just the way that the universe is, and there's no need to explain its it it you know need to explain it. It just is this way. But I think where there is an argument against that, and I'm trying to think, is that the universe, like this is the argument from motion, kind of going back to Aristotle. It's this idea of that. how do I explain it? That something caused everything to start moving. Right. And, um, and not only did it cause it to start moving, it caused it to start moving in particular ways. And so there is this thing that has acted in the cosmos because if that thing, uh, um, if, if there was no motion, imagine that there's no motion anywhere in the universe, right? It's sort of like something has to move. This is kind of Aristotle's contention. And so there becomes this need for a prime mover. And the best explanation of something that has volition that can cause things without having a prior cause, the best candidate for that is a mind, right? Because I can choose to act. As kind of our scriptures would say, you can act without being acted upon. So if you're going to make inferences about the nature of this thing that set all the rest of it in motion, a um, an agent is something that you can infer to, whereas I don't think material processes, they have to be set into motion. They don't just arbitrarily create they, they don't have a volition, right? And that's I mean, this, is, this is where we'll argument. just get, like, if you believe, and I, I just think you're, uh, like, squirming out of, how do I put this? Like, your faith says, and, and you're a big proponent of, like, hey, we need to 
say what our faith says and be proud of it. And your faith says God has flesh and bone. And now you've, you've changed the definition of flesh and bone. And, no, and reason, I, I haven't the, arbi- well, real quick, real quick. I haven't arbitrarily done that. That like Jesus okay, so, Christ so here's the question. is, is, is the model bone, of what a resurrected, what God's flesh and bone would be like so after is, his resurrection. Is your body here right now, does it have molecules in motion, we'll call it? Yes. And are those molecules in motion required for your mind to exist? Are they required to exist? Yeah, like also if every atom in your body stopped or, moving. Real quick, exist or exist in the form that they exist? Because I believe that, I, I actually believe that this is kind of a, a very unique and powerful Latter-day Saint conception is that all materiality ultimately is, it, it's eternal. So every bit of whatever I am has always existed. It wasn't brought out of nothing at any point. It's okay, just been so- reorganized. I kind of want to pivot to that comment, which is if there is material, then that means there are physical laws that govern that material that must also be eternal. Not necessarily. So you can, you believe in some conception of material that is absent of any physical laws. That is absent of physical laws as we currently understand them. I don't know. I, I didn't say as we physics I'm saying physics is, or even period. We're talking about physics in realms that we don't even, you know, that that are potentially beyond. But the it, realm my point is that you're, you're you're the problem that you bring up with fine tuning. It just extends into the next realm. It extends into all these other problems. Which the the longer I've been out of religion, the more I see that all these answers for or uh, apologist arguments they don't solve the problem. They typically just move it one step, and then it's up to us to chase it into that next realm. So. If you're going to say that our world came into existence because of all these laws of nature and who caused those laws of nature, it's only a mind that can cause laws of nature to put things together. And then you're telling me that in this next realm, there's things that are put together in, in basically there's information in that next realm and minds create information. Then, sorry. Then no, no, I'm, I'm putting I'm putting this up actually. I'm I'm putting something up so that we can yeah discuss yeah, it. yeah put this up because because I want to I want to go through this because you're right to talk about moving things back a step, right? Like you can do that and people do, and that's where anytime you move it back a step, you either face the possibility of infinite regress, or you face the possibility of a ground that that has to exist outside of time as we conceive of it so to to wrap up this main point the main point is if you believe in material in any sense that we understand it today without playing some really extreme definition game there's material requires physical laws to govern that those materials even exist at all and if those laws exist then there's a fine-tuning argument you can make for those laws okay um so let me let me pull up these slides and see what you think of this. Also, real quick, so shout out for know, the, the oh merch. yeah, <laughs> Forrest does have merch now. Apparently, nice. <laughs> yeah, shirts, cool. mugs, sweatshirts. Check out the channel if you wanna wanna order some. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So, real quick. Um, so again, I we live in a universe with particular properties that are in it, right? And those properties allow for life. We know that. Now, one way of saying this, you could just say, well, it just allows for life. And that's just the properties that happen to be. They've always been this way. And we just happen to be, you know, by chance, we're living in a universe that allows for life. No, if it's eternal, then it's not by chance. It, it, see, the thing is, is it still, that still ultimately says that that okay. by chance eternity well, is this way. So fine, you have to bite the bullet either way here because I'm going to say that when you bring up God. I agree, and that that is that there there is an argument to be made to say that yes, that just is the way that God is, and so talking about it in any sort of an eternal sense. But but this is the difference. The fact is is that our universe uh, is put into motion, like our universe seems to have a beginning, 
from from things like the Big Bang, and oh, okay. not so, and so it seems as though something has acted in this cosmic just frozen state. So right? how how would your dice rolling analogy play to the God argument? What do you mean? I, I like use your own argument to argue against the conception of the chance of God. Well, you could say that if you have all all these dices, for instance, that are that are you know ten thousand dice, they all have the number six on it, and they just happen to be that way. That is something that you look at and you go, "Well, okay, it eternally has just been this way, right?" So, so that that's what you said about the universe. It's like, what are the odds? So, if how many dice would you use to represent the complexity of God? The complexity of God, I would. It's it's kind of like the same thing. Right. In this no, sense. That, that, exactly. That, it is the same thing. No, no. Well, and that's the thing, though. But but that we all we all are faced with that that question. Right. So if there is this eternal thing and it just happens to be that way, the question is, is why does that thing that happens to be that way? Why did it end up? Why did we end up emerging from that? Whatever this ground is of reality. See, so. If you say, oh, it's really complex, like how could it, how could this complex thing exist forever? That isn't really the question. The question is, is how that thing, that ground of reality, the the six dices, whatever laid out all over, why does that produce us? So so why does the randomness why does God that, produce that, us? <laughs> why does the randomness that created how how likely is it that it was chance that created God? You can't, the, or, sorry, about, you can't talk about you can't talk about exists. God as being created if God is the eternal thing. Sure. So so what are the odds that chance what is the chance that God is the way that he is? When he when you're dealing with eternity past, an item that has always existed, you can't ask about the chances of them coming to exist because ultimately they just are the way that they are. The thing is, is why is what is as it is, or, you know, this, again, the ground of reality that we're going to talk about, if you're going to say that it's just the properties of the universe, the constants and quantities just are the way that they are, they've always been the way that they are, there's a big question to say, why are they this way that we emerged out of that? Now, if, if you, on the other hand, with theism, you can say, well, why did we emerge out of this thing that is God? Well, there you there's all sorts of plausible reasons as to why we exist, and that's sort of what the story of of creation is. But but there's no answer to why God exists, which is and exactly the dilemma. Always the, the thing is, you're asking for why something that 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 net, that is eternal be like why what caused it to exist. So why it, are our our laws of nature not eternal? Our laws of nature could be eternal. So then, therefore, you have no fine-tuning argument. No, what you have is, is the question is to, the, you could say that the universe is fine-tuned because it's just fine-tuned for life because it's just fine-tuned for life. The question is, why is it fine-tuned for life? I don't, no, and so. Is because it just is. It's eternal. You can't ask why questions for things that are eternal. No, I can ask, why is this eternal thing producing us? Why, so why, why did it produce a universe like this? Because if the eternal thing, right? So so let me pull up the slide. Maybe it'll help a little bit. If you're saying that this thing, X, X is the properties of the universe, the physical constants and quantities of the universe. You are saying, well, what if they just always existed? Fine. Okay. I'm not asking where they came from. I'm asking why are they the way that why did they exist in such a way eternally as to produce life? There, there is no answer to that question for eternal things it, because <clears throat> things that are eternal just always are. They don't have an explanation. No, but they they if the the, the, the thing is this. There's no reason why they had to be this way. It's a really yeah, weird... but there's also no reason why they weren't any other way. That's like the beauty of this get out of jail free eternal card is that you don't have to explain it. You get to just posit it without any explanation. That's fine. I, and I would say that it just doesn't seem plausible to me that 
the universe just happens to be this way that we exist. So does it seem plausible to you that a God just happens to exist that can create a universe that just happens to make us? That's more plausible than that. Than okay, the, so, than so, the you, so the universe is very implausible and you're just adding something that's also, you're not getting rid of this implausibility. No, you're no, no. You're adding no. an extra piece to it. No, I'm, I'm saying that it actually, an inference to the best explanation based on what we do know. What we do know is that agents as we know them minds in the in the universe that they have the ability to act and to create things and i don't believe that the laws of the universe are fundamental i believe that they emerged i believe that they're emergent and i believe that that's what the science actually points to so again you say okay well maybe that's moving it back a step to say okay well where you know to god's realm or whatever you're right how, how did god's mind start to act what mind made his mind start to act? He, a mind doesn't have to be caused by anything. I can I can cause things to happen that were I, I like and, this and kind this of free will thing. Is where, this is where we have a fundamental disagreement. If I stopped every molecule in your body at this moment, you would not have the ability to cause anything. That's because you presuppose a a materialist worldview that is well fundament that believes that the the laws of physics as we currently understand them govern all things well perhaps but there's also one other piece i also presuppose that in order for your spirit to interact with the physical world it has to be able to control physical things so if yeah, i but i don't froze I don't, all the molecules in your body how is your spirit talking gonna do about something? being able to cause things within a physical within a physical space i know but we're cause, talking about causing the universe so how could a i think we're getting linguistically confused here a little bit we are yeah because because i'm when i because I, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying in, so we'll use, you're saying minds can cause things. Yes. Without being caused. Without any physical movement. Yeah. With, they, they are able to, a, a mind is able to cause something without being caused. That's one of the properties of a mind. That's what so free. If, so if I froze every atom in your body, you believe you could cause movement. And by, and by froze, I don't mean like they can't move once you hit them, but what is going to make the atoms start moving in the first place? This is like a philosophical, an interesting philosophical point about like, how does it's, it's the same question you have for Jeff McCullough of how does spirit interact with material? Yeah, I believe spirit and material are interwoven in some way that I don't fully understand. I am, I tend to be panpsychist in that sense, but I actually would say that, that material if I'm going to posit some sort of a theory, it would be a, it would be a, that material is actually emergent from mind. And so that materiality does move because of mind. And do you have any reason to believe this? Yeah, it's the, that's probably the best solution to the hard problem of consciousness. It, it, I would say it may be a solution. I haven't looked into it, but is there any, evidence for this besides a philosophical answer which which is fine i understand that yeah my own consciousness my consciousness exists yeah, but, but and as my soon consciousness as you die, your body stops working all of our world. evidence shows that you're not able to do anything what was that all of our evidence shows that if your body dies your spirit is unable to do anything that so, so i would say if you want to <laughs> your best inference or uh, the inference to the best explanation i would say your body, in order for your mind to work, your body has to work, not the other way around. In order for your mind, yeah, you, you believe that you believe that mind is emergent from material. Yes, and, and I would say, and well, psychists we're, we're talking, and idealists would say that that I that understand, material so I understand is that, emergent what I'm from is, mind. If you want to talk best explanation based off of inferences of the world that we live in, how many people that have their bodies stop working, have you seen able to, to make things happen? Basically, how many dead people do you see doing things? That's my question. Doing things in the physical world? Well, obviously, death is a disconnection of... Yeah, but the, of, you're, of you're positing your that mind, mind can make matter move. It's mind that comes first. So there, there's you would expect to see some mind that that can exist without the matter. 
Well, that's assuming that mind is something that you can observe in a test tube or scientifically in some way. All, all I'm saying is all of our evidence, all of our experiential evidence is that you kill the body, the mind dies. But in, implying that the mind is dependent on the body, not the other way around. Yeah, I would I would disagree with that. I, I don't know that there's I think that the problem is, is the kind of evidence that you're willing to actually admit to the conversation. I think, for instance, things like near death experiences have a very robust uh, body of evidence that give credence to the idea that our minds are something that that can even transcend our bodies. Um, I also think the fact that the uh, things like neuroplasticity, for instance, like based on what you think. And like what you're thinking about, you can actually transform your brain. You can actually change your brain's chemistry, which if the brain causes all of everything, then how is it that mind is able to alter the brain if the brain is really what's ultimately controlling everything? So there, there's that's a whole other conversation. I know. Yeah, we um, kind of got derailed a little bit. But but uh, I do want to I want to real quickly go through these slides because I think it's important for everyone. Uh, to 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 understand this concept that I'm going to go through real quick. Um, so we can look at the properties of our universe and we ask, okay, if those properties are not eternal, okay, they emerged from something. Well, then we have the issue. Let me uh, do this real quick. Some people will posit, okay, there's just multiple universes out there and we just happen to be in the one that has the properties that are able to 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 create life. But that creates this other realm. It's like the realm in which all of those universes exist and something, some properties of that, let's call it universe 2.0 or the multiverse, that thing has particular properties, right? And so you then have to, again, go back to explaining it. Well, why does it have those properties? And those properties must be fine-tuned in a way that create universes, right? And you were right to point this out, okay? You're, what you're faced with, we can just keep doing this. Well, that multiverse so, is inside of another can, one or whatever. I also want to clarify, in most of this discussion, I've been playing ball with the fine-tuning argument. It doesn't mean I agree with it. I think you could just say it is tuned, and we don't know if it's fine or not. But for the sake of the argument, we'll keep going. Yes, fine-tuning all the way down. Yeah, my, my thing is this, okay? I say that, like, if Seth wants to say that our universe has, um, you know, evolution created our universe, some sort of a cosmic evolution. Well, that cosmic evolution is predicated on the properties of the multiverse. So, so this is this is where I've been thinking a lot about this, and we've talked about it even. So this is where I think you're misunderstanding emergence. The beauty of emergence is from very simple processes can emerge complex processes. I, the I, simple processes are random and simple things can't, the, the likelihood of a simple thing happening is much more likely than the likelihood of a complex thing happening. So yeah, when you talk, about, it, the idea is a random thing happened that caused something super simple, and which is likely because of how simple it is. Uh, and again, I don't really know how likely, I don't even want to play that game, but the idea is the, the properties that made this multiplying multiverse it wasn't like those properties just existed. It was something even smaller that then built building blocks to then eventually have properties that appear very complex. Yeah. So that's yeah. how emergence it's goes from very simple to very complex. And, and in these examples, you're jumping to all these things are super complex. So how did they happen? Well, the, you could say it started, it started with something really small. I, which, I totally which was get random that. and totally uh, possible and to I'll totally say likely. That's the thing. It's to say that it was something, it was a random chance event happening. But again, you still run into the problem of infinite causation because either something happened, the first thing that happened ever, or else there were things that have been yeah. happening forever I mean, I, into the infinite past. I 100% agree that you run into the dilemma of infinite regress or it, it, infiniteness. Uh, or uh, eternal existence, uncaused causes. I can't, I'm not saying I know how to escape, escape that dilemma, but I'm also saying that even religious people don't know how to escape that dilemma. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think anyone can, it's an impossibility because either. Which is so interesting because it's, it's the only explanations seem to be both impossible. 
Yeah, it it's is. Like it's such it's a crazy strange one. dilemma it, it that is. we run into. But I do want to say this. It doesn't change the first premise of my argument in the sense that either all of this is the product of a design or it's not. Meaning well, but, it's the product of chance. Yes, those are really but this is where you're doing a little bit of a, a sleight of hand. It's Again, it's not that all of a sudden all the properties of the universe existed. It was that perhaps there was a very simple thing that existed that then caused something a little bit more complex and combined to make something a little bit more complex. And then next thing you know, you see complexity and you're like, how the hell? And that's that? that's where divine simplicity in theology got its thing. But again, you you said it there. Something caught if there if if you're going back to not go infinite regress to that first thing that happened. There is that question of what is there anything that we know of that can cause something without being caused? And, and I am a hundred percent saying no. We have zero evidence of uncaused causes. Yes. And so in that, if you're gonna say that, then you're going to say that the universe has an infinite regress of causes. Because there's no other alternative. No, because that's also seems impossible to me. I have no good answer. I'm just saying, <laughs> I think there's two, uh, I, I think both are impossible. Well, you have to pick one. <laughs> no, I this think, is where religious people feel you have to pick things. I just say, I don't know. And I say, we're screwed and we'll no, figure I'm it saying, out. I'm saying that, that, that at the end of the day, one of the, those are the only two options. The other, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the other one, um, what I would argue though, is I would say we do know of things that can ca uncaused causes. And that's what free will I think shows, but obviously that's a different argument. Um, but that's kind of the theistic, the rationale that's given to say that if there was a first cause, we have to find something that can cause something without being caused. And the best candidate for that is mind because I can right now without being caused, I can reach over and touch this mouse as an agent. So anyway, we're getting a little low on time. Any final thoughts for it to kind of wrap it up? No, I just thought it was, interesting and also i don't know if you really address it and i understand partially why like these topics are big in themselves but when you bring up um the fine-tuning or cosmological ar arguments i don't know if you ever really specify i i'm bringing in the material baggage with this argument that in my mind adds some complexities that i don't know if they were ever really addressed sounds good well We'll have to pick it up uh, in another episode. But hey, everybody, thanks for joining us this evening. We'll catch you in the next one. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode and want to try to improve your engagement with those you disagree with, I want to share with you a few of the principles that Forrest and I try to abide in these conversations. First, we try to steel man each other's perspective before offering a critique. We make sure that the other person feels that we have not misrepresented their point of view. When you are not addressing the actual argument the other person is making, you just end up talking past each other. Second, we seek clarity, not consensus. We are trying to understand the nature of our disagreement and clarify the distinctions between our different points of view by comparing and contrasting the different ways we justify our position. Instead of the discussion being about winning an argument, it's about two people curiously exploring how they arrived at their different conclusions. And third, just things as simple as defining your terms can do immense good in conversation. So often people talk past each other simply because the words they are using are vague or can mean different things to different people. Much conflict comes not because of disagreement, but simply because of confused language and misunderstanding. In the end, our shared goal in these discussions is not just to engage with each other on a variety of topics, but hopefully to model how people with wildly different opinions can engage meaningfully. Do we always succeed? Of course not. But we hope that to some extent, we can be part of the solution in bridging the gaps between people of different opinions. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.